So I said I'd start by asking for questions about the projects. Anyone want to ask anything? If not, correcting for time series data like GDP, do we take the log or do we? A variable like GDP that tends to grow at a fixed rate over time, you'll want to take the log of those kinds of things. Yes. Consumption, investment, anything, population, employment, anything like that. But something like an unemployment rate, where it stays relatively level through time, I mean, there's a lot of swings in it. That's not the kind of variable you want to take the log of, because it's not going to grow exponentially over time. So one use of logs is simply whenever you have those growth variables. What it does is if you, if you apply a fixed growth rate to a series, it'll tend to grow at an increasing rate. And by taking the log of it, it makes that linear. And so it takes it from a process. If you just look at time versus, say, yt, it'll tend to look like this. And you'll get a, a relatively non-linear looking process. But once you take the log of it, so you've got the log of GDP here, then it will tend to be a much straighter line. And you're modeling a lot better with, with a linear process. OK, then. So we are talking about errors and variables in particular. But it's part of a broader topic that will continue into chapter 9. We're currently on chapter 8. And that is the problem of having the right-hand side variable correlated with the error term. So this chapter is about errors and variables, mismeasured variables, proxy variables, that sort of thing, what happens. We haven't talked about it yet, but also how you can fix it. And we're going to see almost exactly the same kind of problem arise when we go to the next chapter, which is about simultaneous equation systems. Like when you have two equations, a supply and a demand curve, and they, and they interact in some way. How do we handle that econometrically? We'll see the same problem. So, so what we're really looking at is a very general problem. And it's one where the errors in the right-hand side variables are correlated. We'll see that the solution to that problem is something called instrumental variables. I'll give you an example of that today. It's very simple to do in eViews. Um, but conceptually, it, it, these are the, you know, where the, the harder part is. But I don't think they're conceptually that hard either. So, so let's go through this. We already talked a little bit about errors and variables. We showed, for instance, that if you have an x that's measured with error, that induces correlation between the x and the error. And that causes problems in the model. And we worked out the bias and did some other sorts of things with that. So we've already looked at the problem. Um, let's do an example of it, which is Friedman's permanent income hypothesis. And then we'll go on and look at some of the ways to correct for this. So this is Friedman's permanent income hypothesis. And essentially, he's going to use an errors and variables argument to resolve a puzzle in the consumption function literature. So there was a debate between the Keynesians and the monetarists way back when. And Friedman had essentially said that the consumption function was a, was a ray out of the origin. Whereas if you look at a Keynesian kind of a theory, you got a consumption function that looked more like this. It didn't come out of the origin. It had a constant. That's the kind of, when we say C is A plus B, this is disposable income, YD. This is consumption. When we model consumption today, we generally model it this way, something like C is A plus B times YD, where B is the MPC and it's less than 1. This slope would be less than 1, but for Friedman, it was a ray out of the origin. And so what happened was, when they started looking at the data, the data actually supported this view. It didn't support Friedman's theory. So Friedman needed a reason to argue that even when this kind of theory is true, 
This is what you see in the data. And what he made was an errors and variables argument. So we're going to say that the variables in the model are measured with error. What that does is it biases beta 2 downward. So you get a flatter slope. And it biases the constant upward. So you, get a, you go from 0 to a positive constant. So the mere fact that you observe this in the data doesn't necessarily mean that this theory is wrong. If, you are in if there are, in fact, errors and variables in the model, that's exactly what you'd expect. If this was true, this is what you would see in the data. So, so let's go through the argument, go through the bias, and see if, see if we can show this. So let's start with a little bit of theory here. The permanent income hypothesis, the PIH, says that consumption for an individual, their permanent consumption, their average, their long-run consumption, is some function of their permanent consumption. This is the variable that's going to make all the difference. Now, for Friedman, permanent consumption was the interest rate times the individual's wealth. And this had both human and non-human. This has human capital plus non-human wealth as well. Part of your wealth is your human capital, your education, your abilities, and all, all those sorts of things. So don't worry too much. I don't want to go through the macroeconomics under, underneath this specification too much. But basically, you can just think of this as your average expected lifetime income. So if you think you're going to inherit a billion dollars when you're 35 years old, that's going to raise your expected lifetime income, your permanent income, and you're probably going to consume more today. So your consumption today is not a function of your current income today. It's a function of your expected lifetime income, your average lifetime income. <coughs> and that permanent income is what makes the big difference in consumption. This is what lies behind the notion that temporary tax cuts don't do much good. Because if you only cut taxes temporarily, it has almost no effect on your permanent income. If I give you a one-shot rebate today, Okay, you got a tax cut today, but over your whole lifetime, the next 30, 40, 50 years, that's nothing. And so it does very little to raise that permanent income, and, and consumers shouldn't respond much to it by increasing consumption. But if the tax cut were permanent, then every year you get more income, that raises your permanent income, and that raises your consumption more than it would for a temporary change. In this model, temporary income changes are mostly saved because it doesn't affect consumption. So this is the particular specification, but conceptually, if you want to think of this as just average expected future <coughs> income, that works just great in this model. OK. Now, actual income and actual consumption are a little bit different. So why I, for an individual, is that individual's permanent consumption income plus their temporary income, all the variation from year to year that's, that's not permanent. So there's some temporary random components from year to year, then there's this underlying trend or long run or permanent component. And so you have these two things. Now notice that this is what we observe. We don't observe permanent income. We might be able to estimate it, but even then we're likely to be making errors. And so we do not observe this variable, but this is what's essential for working out the consumption function. If you write this out, consumption is just some constant times income in Friedman's theory, so it would be a ray out of the origin, essentially, in, in this model. Okay, and then if you look at actual income, um, or actual consumption, you have the same problem. Consumption is permanent consumption plus temporary consumption. So there's errors and variables in both, uh, in both cases. We don't observe either variable directly that we need to observe. Now what we learned last time is that an error in the dependent variable 
a measurement error in the dependent variable doesn't hurt us at all. All that does is add to the error in the model. I mean, it hurts us. It adds to the overall error in the model, so it makes it less efficient, it makes it less precise. But it doesn't cause bias or cause any problems. Given the error that's in the model, your estimates are still blue. And so this part is not going to be much of a, a problem. You could get away with just say actual consumption here, but, but we'll stick with the theory. So, so the problem is going to be here. So we believe, say, so what, so what this theory tells us is that permanent consumption should be beta 2 times permanent income. So that's the regression we'd like to run. We'd like to run permanent consumption on permanent income and see what this coefficient is. We could also add a constant to the model and test to see if it's zero. So if you actually had these data, you could add a constant beta 1, estimate this, see if the constant was zero statistically like it should be under this theory, and see if beta 2 is less than 1. See, see, what, see what beta 2 is here. Now what they actually did, of course, was run actual consumption or an actual income. And that's when they got this. And so now we want to show that that's what you'd expect. This is the true model, and you regress not permanent on permanent, but actual on actual. You'll get this outcome. So all we have to do is the usual trick. We'll just... So to test, we'd like to run um, CIP is B1 plus B2 YIP plus, I guess the book uses VI here. And then one null here would be that beta 1 equals 0. That'd be one test of Friedman versus the Keynesians. But what if we use actual data here? So you look over there, CIP is just CI minus the temporary. YIP is YI minus temporary. So what you'd really be running is CI minus CI temporary is beta 1 plus beta 2 times YI minus YIT plus VI. So let's isolate the regression we'd actually end up running if we regressed YI on CI. So if we just solve this, we get CI equals beta 1 plus beta 2 yi. So that's part of the regression. Plus vi plus ci tra temporary <laughs> transpose. Too much matrix algebra. Um, minus beta 2 yi t. Now I need to go back here because there's something I forgot to tell you over here that I should have. My fault, but it's not a big deal. So we're going to assume that YIT and CIT are uncorrelated random variables. So these are just random shocks to income and consumption, and the shock to income and the shock to consumption are uncorrelated. They're also uncorrelated with YP and CP.
I'm saying this and this are just random shocks. Call them ui and wi or whatever you want. These are just random variables. They're uncorrelated and they're uncorrelated with these two things. So these are just independent random shocks. They're not correlated with anything in the model. That's all we're saying. Flip a coin and there you got a shock. It has nothing to do with anything else in the model. That's all we're saying. So this and this are uncorrelated. But the problem is, what's yi equal to? It's equal to yp plus yt. So when yt goes up, what happens here? Y goes up, right? But we also have yt here. So the, this and this will be correlated. Now this is what we can call ui. This whole term is the error term. That's a random shock, that's a random shock, that's a random shock. They're all independent. Doesn't really matter if they are here, but they, they are. So this is UI, and the problem then is this is correlated with this. We already did this problem. We know what happens. This will be biased downward. Beta 2, if we run this model, will be biased downward. The slope will be too flat. So instead of getting this slope, we'll get something flatter than that. You remember how that argument goes? So we're going to use this argument again and again and again. You'll use it in your homework. So let's, let's go through it one more time. So it's always the case in a two-variable model like that that beta 2 hat is beta 2 plus the sum of the, in this case, now be careful, this is a different yi than usual. This is GDP, it's not the left-hand side yi. So this, this, is a, this is an x, even though we call it a y. I'm just following the book's notation. So this will be yi minus y bar times ui minus u bar, but u bar is zero, <coughs> over the sum of the yi minus y bar squared. Normally, this is a, normally we call that thing on the right side x. C is b1 plus b2x. So this is xi, x bar, ui, xi minus x bar squared. It's, it's nothing different. So when we take the p limb of beta 2 hat, all that means is we let n go to infinity, we make the sample perfect, we know everything. That's beta 2. Oh, we do the 1 over n trick here, plus the covariance of y and u over the variance of y. So that's beta 2 plus the covariance of y. And what is u? u is this right here. vi minus cit minus beta 2 yit. I should be writing yi here. It's minus yit. Oh, plus here. Yeah. Yeah, I've got a minus. So plus here. Yeah. <laughs> Here it looks like a minus. 
because that middle line is thicker. I can't see it from this angle. Then what's yi equal? So this is over the variance. trying to do this in drawn out steps. So this is equal to beta 2 plus the covariance of yip plus yit and vi plus cit minus beta 2 yit over the variance yip plus yit. I just substitute it in for yi. <coughs> so is yit correlated with yip? No, that's one of our assumptions. Those are uncorrelated. That's why we made it. Is CIT correlated with YIP? No, no. VI is not correlated with anything in the model. So this isn't correlated with any of it. YIT is not correlated with VI. YIP is not correlated with that. But it is correlated with itself. So the only terms that sort of intersect here are going to be that term and that term. So when I multiply this out, this will be beta 2 minus beta 2 sigma squared yt. That's the top part. You see that, or do I need to do more steps? When you write this all out, You can break this up into two terms. So this is beta 2 plus the covariance of yi with all the other stuff plus the covariance of yit with the, all the other stuff. I'll write it out this time. Okay. Yip here, this term, isn't correlated with anything in here. These are both over the variance of, of yip plus yit of yi. So this one's zero because yip isn't correlated with any of the other errors in the model. This is uncorrelated with that. This is uncorrelated with that. So this ends up being, you could multiply those all out and then take the expectation and the like, but it's just going to be zero. The covariances are going to be zero. So this turns out to just be beta 2 plus the covariance of minus beta 2 yit and yit over the variance of yip plus yit. Because this is not correlated with that, not correlated with that. You only pick up those two terms. Those are the only things that are non-zero. I didn't finish this. Over sigma squared yp plus sigma squared yt. So this is equal to theta 2 minus this covariance. Well, that's just a variance because it's the covariance with itself. So it's minus beta 2 sigma squared yt, the variance of that term, over the variance of this plus the variance of this plus 2 times their covariance, but the covariance is 0. So this just becomes over sigma squared yp plus sigma squared yt. So it's beta 2 times 1 minus sigma squared yt 
over sigma squared yp plus sigma squared yt. And that's less than beta 2. Too many steps, probably. We're just going to keep doing this same derivation over and over and over. So this is the part where you'll stumble. This is what you need to get. Just how to do this covariance thing. And it's essentially just a FOIL method that you use for multiplying out, you know, x plus 2 times x minus 3, that times that, that times that, that times that. Just multiply the whole thing out and take all the covariances of the individual terms. Once you do that, the only thing that's going to survive are the things that are related. Any two terms that are independent are always going to get annihilated after you take the expectation. So, basically, I just multiplied this out. That times that, 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 that times that. But the only thing that survives is when I multiply those two together, because everything else is independent. When I take the covariance, it goes to zero. So you basically just look at this and find the terms that are related, and that's the only thing that's going to survive out of those covariances. But you can just write it all out by multiplying the whole thing out and then taking the covariances individually as well. This has to be a fraction. We know variances are positive, so this is something over the same thing plus something else. This is yp plus yt, that's yt. So this is a fraction. 1 minus a fraction is a fraction. So this is a fraction of beta 2. So what we get is a downward bias beta 2. We get something that's too flat. And we, we, we knew that result already. We derived that result last time. I just re-derived it this time for a different model. A slightly different model. The book does this with a Monte Carlo exercise. I'm going to do a little bit different. I didn't think their explanation really, I don't know. I'm going to do it a different way. We also need to show that the constant is biased upward. So I want to show that the, when beta 2 is biased downward, that causes beta 1 to be biased upward. Now, if you remember the formula for beta 1 hat, it's y bar minus beta 2 hat x bar. So once you estimate beta 2 hat, the way you get y beta 1 hat is through this formula. Now, if I have the true mean minus the true beta 2, uh, the true mean of y, minus the true beta 2 times the true mean of x, I'll get the true beta 1. Okay. These are, this is estimate of the actual mean, but if I knew the mean, this is an estimate, this is an estimate. If I know the actual values of these, I'll get the true value of this. So uh, normally when I take the, when I let n go to infinity, this goes to u of y, this goes to beta 2, and this goes to u of x, and I get the true beta 2. But suppose beta 2 hat is biased downward so that the p limb of beta 2 hat is beta 2 minus some constant. That's the bias. It's downward biased by C. So now, take the P limb of beta 1 hat. Well, it's U of Y. So far, so good. Minus, uh-oh, here I get beta 2 minus C instead of beta 2, but this is fine, I still get the u of x. So what I get is u of y minus beta 2 u of x plus c u of x. That's what the p limb is. 
This part is just fun. This part is beta 1. That's this. And so the answer we get is beta 1 plus C U of X. It's beta 1 plus a positive number. It's bias upward if the mean of X is positive. Did you get the u1 minus beta 2ux equal to beta 1? Here? Yeah. The normal formula for the normal formula for beta 1 hat is y bar minus beta 2 hat x bar. So that's how you normally get it. Then what you do is you take the p limb of theta 1 hat. This goes to the true mean of y. If this is unbiased and consistent, it goes to the true um, theta 2. And this goes to the true u of x. Now if you just look at the model, yi is beta 1 plus beta 2 xi plus ui. y bar minus beta 2 x bar equals beta 1. But this, the, the true, if I, if I just average these and get the true y, so if I average that, I'll get u of y. If I average that, I just get beta 1. If I average this, I get u of x. The true mean of this is zero. And so beta 1 is equal to this. So I can use this formula to recover the true beta 1. So whenever I see this, that's beta 1. <coughs> so what I did here is just say, well, suppose this p limb here is off. Suppose it's biased downward. That then makes beta 1 biased. Any bias in here? One of your homework problems has y bar being biased. So y is not only measured with error. Maybe it's a problem I do as an example. Suppose that not only, suppose that yi is yi star plus c plus vi. Not only is there an error, there's a bias. You'll get the same problem because when you take the mean of this, you won't get the true mean of y. You'll get u of y plus c. And that'll throw the thing off. So whenever any one of these are biased, you'll get a bias in beta 1. And I simply put a bias right there. So the point is that the constant's too high, the slope's too low, and that's exactly what we'd expect to see. If this was the true relationship between permanent consumption and permanent income, and we take it to actual data, we'll get a slope that's too big, a slope that's too small, and an intercept that's too big. So that you'll get exactly what we saw in the data. And so the econometricians <coughs> hadn't ruled out Friedman's theory after all, just because the data resulted in a consumption function that looked like this. That was not, it turns out, evidence against Friedman's theory. In fact, that's exactly what you'd expect to see if the theory was true. So he used errors and variables to turn the results on their head and say, actually, they're consistent with my theory, not inconsistent. The way you do these problems is always the same. You start with a true model, then you sub in the, me the, the variables that are measured with error into the true model and isolate what you can actually measure. When you do that, you'll get yi equals beta 1 plus beta 2 xi plus ui. Now in this case, ui was like vi plus y cit minus beta 2 yit. But we isolate the model in this way. And xi is xi star plus something. 
but we just isolate the model in this way. So, so you start off with the true model, yi is beta 1 plus beta 2 xi star plus vi, that's the true model. X is measured with error. So there's the measurement error. That's some random variable. So you say, okay, well, xi star is xi minus wi. And I just plug that into there and say, okay, well, yi is beta 1 plus beta 2 xi plus vi minus beta 2 wi. So after substituting in and doing this little bit of algebra, you'll get that. Then this is just ui. So now it's in this form. So you just take the true model, sub in the variables that are measured with error, and write it in this form. What you measure, what you measure, and then the error. Then use the fact that beta 2 hat is always beta 2 plus the covariance of x and u over the variance of x. Well, the p limit is that. So that's always true. Once you get it in that form, that's always true. And the only hard part of the problem is figuring out what that term is. Once you have that term figured out, you, if this is zero, no bias. No, it's not inconsistent. I keep saying bias when I mean inconsistency. If that's non-zero, there is a bias. The mere fact that these are correlated and the variance is non-zero tells you everything you need to know. You know it's inconsistent. Getting the exact degree of inconsistency means evaluating this term. Now, in the case I just did, x i is x i star plus omega i, and u i here is v i minus beta 2 w i. So they're going to be correlated because these two terms are the same. You're going to pick up a relationship between the two w i's. So when you multiply that out, you'll have four terms. You'll have an x i star v i, x i star w i, w i v i, w i w i. And it's only the wi, wi term that's going to be non-zero. Everything else is independent of each other by assumption. And so the only thing that's going to be, I just did exactly the same problem again. You're going to get beta 2 minus beta 2 sigma squared w over sigma squared x star plus sigma squared w. It's exactly the result we just got. This, this, this is just a beta 2 minus beta 2 sigma squared w over sigma squared x star plus sigma squared w. It's exactly the same result we just got. It's just that our terms were a little more complicated that we had to evaluate. But it's always the same thing. Write down the true model, sub in the things that are measured with error, recast it in terms of measurables and whatever error you get once you've written it in terms of your measurables, then evaluate the regression you actually run. This is the regression you actually run, yi on xi. It will have these properties. The beta 2 hat will always be beta 2 plus the covariance of that with that over the variance of that. That's always going to be true. So then you just evaluate this term, and that's where you're having trouble, and you're done. So I think that when you, you know, the, most of this is easy, and it's just really this part that, that you're having trouble. Now, the worst case scenario on a test is you say, oh, gosh, I've forgotten how to do this, and then, but, 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 I know they're correlated because this has a WI in it, this has a WI in it, this can't be zero, therefore there's bias. But you can at least look, see through the problem enough to tell me you understand that there's bias and why there's bias, even if you can't formally do the problem. I, I want you to be able to formally do them, but the mere fact that you've got a WI in both these terms tells you they're correlated, tells you there's a covariance. Whether you can evaluate it or not is another matter, but you ought to be able to at least see that much. Looking at this, you ought to be able to say, okay, there's a WI in here, 
There it is. It's in XI. There's a WI here. So those are correlated. That's bias. And it's, there's the formula for it. And so this was just a detailed application of that general Another example? Oh, you got it. I was just—I have an example in my notes that really just does the constant bias I just did, so it's probably not very useful. I don't know, maybe. It's... To something else. I'm going to save this for oh here's a better example. I'll do this one. So this is problem 86 in the notes. So the true model is Q equals beta 1 plus beta 2 z plus v. But in this case, q is part of z. This is like re you know, re regressing consumption on income. And income is c plus i plus g. So you know, consumption is in the thing you're running. And that's what you're trying to find. Well, let's, let's say there's a common measurement error for some reason. One is that one contains the other. But what, for whatever reason, there's a common measurement error. So what we actually get is yi is qi plus some measurement error, and xi is the zi plus some measurement error. So we don't observe the things we want to observe. We observe noisy versions of them. But the noise is the same in both. We make the same measurement error in both cases. We're using the same faulty ruler to measure both variables. So in the lab, some key instrument's off, and you need that instrument to measure both y and x, and it makes the same error in both cases. It just adds something to it. So is beta 2 hat consistent or not? Well, you already know if this is measured with error, it's not. But what's the degree of the inconsistency? What is, how far off will we be? So again, we just sub into the original model. So we say, all right, qi is yi minus wi equals beta 1 plus beta 2. And uh, zi is xi minus wi plus vi. Then we write the model in terms of the things we can actually observe, actually measure. So yi is beta 1 plus beta 2 xi plus vi plus wi minus beta 2 wi. So the only thing really different between, this is exactly the permanent income. This is permanent income, consumption, permanent income, permanent temporary, permanent and temporary. This is what we actually measure. The only difference is, is the error is the same. So in the problem we did earlier, this was yit and this was cit because ci was measured with a different error than yi now they're the same what difference does that make well you're just going to pick up an extra term here so this is ui so now we have the form we need so 
So that's, that's what we were looking for. That's what we want. Because now we know that P limb of beta 2 hat is beta 2 plus the covariance of xi. Slow down and write so they can read it. Plus the covariance of xi and ui over the variance of xi. And then again, the only thing that's tough is this term. This is usually pretty easy because we usually make the assumption that this and this are uncorrelated. So it's just the variance of this plus the variance of this. So that, let's do the easy part first. So that's beta 2 plus the covariance of xi and ui over, well, what's that? That's just sigma squared z plus sigma squared w. That's the variance of the xi. Plus 2 times the covariance of x and w, of z and w. But we're making the assumption w is independent of z. So we just need that covariance. What's xi equal to? This is zi plus wi. What's ui equal to? vi plus wi times 1 minus beta 2, just to combine a couple of terms there. So when I multiply those out, I'll get a zi vi. Will that be non-zero? That's zero, right? I'll get a zi wi. That's zero. I'll get a wi vi. That's zero. Then I'll get a wi wi 1 minus beta. That's the term that's going to matter. And what's different here is this one. Before, in the last models, this was some other random variable in the permanent income model. So you didn't get any correlation. So you didn't get a one here, and you got the minus beta two. So that, that's, that's the only difference. So this becomes beta two plus the covariance of wi and 1 minus beta 2 wi over sigma squared z plus sigma squared x. I just isolated the term that matters and made everything else zero. Is that okay? Sigma squared w. Thank you. That's a really bad looking z. Hopefully the crossing one helps you tell them from twos, because I could never tell them apart when I used to do this stuff. Started crossing. So the answer is beta two plus one minus beta two times sigma squared W over sigma squared z plus sigma squared w. Whether this is positive or negative depends upon the size of beta 2. If beta 2 is bigger than 1, you get one answer. If beta 2 is less than 1, you get another. So this time, it's not necessarily biased downward. It depends upon the size of beta 2. Actually, if you take their setup seriously, the book is saying, here's why we get this. Q is in Z. If Q is in Z, you'd probably expect beta 2 to be a fraction. And if beta 2 is a fraction, you know what the answer is. But in general, if these are measured with error, and Q doesn't have to be a subset of Z, then you don't know anything about beta 2. And so the bias in this case, Normally that one is missing, so you know it's negative. But in this case, the one shows back up because of, because of this term right here. And that's because of this term 
being the same as that term. So that term shows up there and shows up there. And it didn't in the permanent income case. So you get a different bias. Hmm? Is that correlation? V I or W I? This one? No, no, no. The, the right side. Yeah. This is a W and this is a W. Why it's become W, not V I? That term is W I, mm -hmm. and that term is W I. When I multiply these out, so I, I basically get ZI plus WI correlated with, with um, VI plus 1 minus beta 2 WI. So I'll get four terms. I'll get a ZI, VI term, but those are uncorrelated. I could be doing something dumb and not seeing it, so go ahead. And that one would be zero. Then the second part. Um, I know the first. You part. don't multiply this, these two together ever. Yeah. No, I mean I know the first part will become zero, but the second part. So zi vi and zi wi. That's that and that. That and that. Those are zero. Oh. Then you'll get wi. VI, which is that and that, that's zero. And it's only when you get those two terms together that you get a non zero outcome. Okay. Okay. No, that's helpful. I skipped that step. I got it, yes. So like, yes. <laughs> a light bulb went on somewhere, at least one. So I can at least take solace in that fact. Now I see some heads nodding. I even see people go, move on, I get this. So, so let's do that. Okay, um, so <laughs> put some homework problems so you can practice this. It's in the book, you can study it. And, you know, I don't expect necessarily that me doing it once on the board is all it takes for you to get it. So you'll, you'll, you'll want to take a look at this and make sure you got this. This technique is that it's the same every time again. Write down the true model, sub in the measured vari variables measured with error, isolate them, evaluate the bias. Okay, what do we do about this problem? So how do we solve it? How to solve it? So the solution to this problem is to use something called instrumental variables. So one of your homework, one of your homework problems asks this exact question. How do you know if a variable has measurement error? <coughs> you have to just think so. Generally, what happens to you is you'll conceptually want one variable. So conceptually, you'll say to yourself, you know, I really need the X anti real interest rate to evaluate investment properly. But in the data, what I can, the only thing I can measure effectively is the X post real rate. Well, I know the X post real interest rate is equal to the X anti plus some shock. And so then if I run a regression using the X post instead of the X anti, what will happen? And so that's a case where you just, you know, just thinking about it. You, you might worry that in the census data, the top incomes aren't, the top coding in the census data is very bad. And so some of the incomes at the top end are measured very poorly. So if you're using income data, you'll get very bad estimates in some cases, probably not very good. So survey data is inherently noisy. If you're using survey data, you might think you're getting good. But it just is a matter of sort of thinking about the problem and then asking yourself whether what you're using in the model is, is close enough theoret to what you mean theoretically by the variable, and if so, it's probably okay. And then, then how it was measured. So would you say that um, like percent of income, I'm assuming that that would be overstated or understated? Um, at the high end? 
they try to correct for this, but often it's understated. So in the census data, you just check a box that says it used to be. They, 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 there's some other surveys that sort of take care of this, but if you just check a box saying my income is one million or over, then you don't have a good estimate of what the actual incomes are in that range. In the old census forms, that's how they collected the data. And you also might have an income of 20,000 or below. So yeah, when you look at income for those groups, they'll be, it'll be inherently noisy. Because you don't even know necessarily what the mean or the median of that distribution is. You only have data on that, that one million. In that case, the bias is probably as a constant bias. If you use the one million figure for the income, you know you're using a figure that's biased downward. And so it's not a random bias. And you want to take account of that. But, but, but often those data that come out of surveys like that will have those kinds of problems. So if it says something like 0.5% or 1% of people make X amount. Well, that's a different question because then you're OK because your dividing lines are correct. But if you're using the actual income in those groups, you, you don't necessarily know what, what it is. Even if you're saying 10 to 20, you, you don't necessarily know what the distribution is. And so it's not necessarily the case that the mean is in the middle. I mean, it probably is, but you know, there's probably some measurement here and there. Uh, but that, that's the kind of thought process you have to go through is you know, how severe is the measurement error? Is there any bias in, in, in those kinds of things? So one of your homework problems asks, what's a good instrument? And so, uh, so what can we do about severe measurement error? Again. The, the bias in the simple case <coughs> this is the measurement error. If this is tiny, if the measurement error is tiny, the bias is tiny and you probably don't need to worry much about it. So it's only when the measurement error is fairly severe that you need to do anything about it. So the first thing is sort of how bad is the measurement error? Now, where the dividing line is, I, that's the art of econometrics. I mean, if you think it's severe, do something about it. If it's not severe, you don't have to. Exactly where that dividing line is, is I can't tell you exactly. It just depends on, on the case you're looking at. But let's suppose it's severe. What can you do about it? So let's suppose that yi is beta 1 plus beta 2 xi plus ui, and um, xi is correlated with ui. For some reason, it could be measurement error, but for this, what we're doing now, it doesn't have to be measurement error. All I need is that those two things are correlated. What we've shown is that measurement error induces a correlation, but it's not the only way you could get a correlation. We'll, we'll show other ways later on. And so th this solution is more general than the problems we're looking at. But it applies to, to, to that as well. OK. Suppose we have another variable. With three properties. And so just since you're here, this may help you on your homework. I think there's a question to ask about the three properties of an instrument. Um, one, Z is correlated with X. The more it's correlated, the better, but minimally it needs to be correlated. The more correlated, the better, but it needs to at least be correlated. Z is uncorrelated. with the error. We'll talk later maybe, you know, I guess I do have to talk about it, about how to find instruments. But for now, let's just write down their properties and see what happens if we can find something like this. The third thing, which I think is kind of redundant, but the book says it anyway, C is not one of the X's. <laughs> C 
So what we're going to do is, is look at a brand new estimator. Beta 2 hat OLS. This is what you've been doing before. Is the sum of the xi minus x bar, yi minus y bar, sum xi minus x bar squared. We want to try a new estimator, beta 2 hat IV, an instrumentals variable, instrumental variables estimator. It's the sum of the zi minus z bar times yi minus y bar over the sum of the zi minus z bar times xi minus x bar. We're going to use that estimator instead. And when you punch the right buttons in eViews, it gives you that estimator instead of that one. So doing it on the computer, which I'd hope to do today, but looks like we'll end up doing next time, um, is really easy. You just put the instruments in the box and say estimate, and it does it. So let's look at this estimator, and we're going to use exactly the same trick we've been using before. So we want to see if this estimator, we know this is inconsistent. When x and u are correlated. That's what we've been showing all day. We want to look at this estimator and show it's, it's consistent. We've overcome the problem with this estimator. It's not as precise. You'll have a slightly bigger variance, but it is So what we're going to do is sub in for these terms. So beta 2 hat IV is the sum of the zi minus z bar times yi minus y bar. But we know what yi and y bar are. So let me write that out just a second here. So this is beta 1 plus beta 2 xi plus ui. That's yi minus beta 1 plus beta 2 x bar, because I want to take y bar, um, plus u bar. But that is 0 all over. So this, this is y bar. This is just y i minus y bar. Should have put that up on top so I didn't interfere with my, what's the line called between the numerator and the numerator? Getting old. Divided by this term, sum zi minus z bar. Let me take those out. This is just yi minus y bar. You know, I always do this. The equals in the wrong. Not that it matters. I didn't do anything fancy. I just subbed in for yi and y bar. So this is then equal to, you do it in a bunch of steps, the sum of the zi minus z bar, that's that term, times beta 2 xi minus beta 2 x bar plus ui. Because notice the beta 1's cancel. Ice cream trucks. 
Grazie. So that's equal to <coughs> beta two times sum z i over z bar times x i times x bar over the sum z i minus z bar is x i minus x bar plus the sum x i minus x bar times u i over the sum z i minus z bar x i minus x bar. I just took this term here, beta 2xi minus beta 2xi bar. That's the first term. Pull the beta 2 out. You get that minus that times that minus that. And then put this term times that separate. It's divided that from that. It's always do that. But the thing in brackets is 1. So this is beta 2. So beta 2 hat IV is beta 2 plus the sum of the xi minus x bar times ui over the sum xi minus x bar times zi. Now I'll do it the same order. I want to switch the order on you. zi minus z bar. <laughs> Then we take the PLIM. PLIM beta 2 hat IV is beta 2. Do the 1 over n trick. What's this go to? That's the covariance of what and what? <laughs> I did something totally wrong. See what it is? <coughs> what should this be? <coughs> zi. Because x and u are correlated. If this wasn't zi, I was in big trouble. That's just a total mistake in the way I wrote it. That's just, that's my point. This times this is zi minus cr times u. I just totally just made a mistake. My apologies. I hate doing that. It's the ones I don't catch that get in your notes and stay there that bug me more. I don't mind. Whew. So, what does this go to as n goes to infinity? That's the covariance of z and U over the, the covariance of X and Z. But by assumption, what was the assumptions we made about our instrument? It is uncorrelated with the error term. So what do we know about that term? That's zero by assumption. Now, one other thing could go wrong. If this is zero, we're in trouble. But what's our other assumption? Z is correlated with x. So we're not dividing by zero. We're dividing by something. So this just equals beta 2. Because this part 
is zero, and this is non-zero by assumption. Because we said z and x are correlated, the properties of the instrument are it's something correlated with x, but not correlated with u. So that's exactly what we need. So if we can find such a variable, then it's easy to solve the errors and variable problem. In macro, it's pretty easy to find instruments. I'll talk more about instruments later, but suppose you think that you've got income on the right-hand side and you think it's correlated with the error. So say your model is like CI is A plus BYI plus UI, and you worry that's correlated. Let me do this in T's. Well, you could use Y T minus 1 as an instrumental variable. Because this happened yesterday, it can't be correlated with a random variable that happened today. And so y t minus 1 is generally uncorrelated. Now, if this is serially correlated, we've got troubles. But as long as this is just a regular random variable, that won't be correlated with that. But y t minus 1 and y t are highly correlated. Conditions in the economy today are highly related to the way they were last week, or last month, or last quarter. So there's a lot of correlation between those two, but there's no correlation there. So this serves as an effective instrument. So in macro, you can just lag things for the most part to, to get instrumental variables. One last thing about this. Um, we're not going to do this. I'm not going to derive this. But if you were to look at, in, in a model, yt or yi, it doesn't matter, beta 1 plus beta 2 xi plus ui. And then we, we use an iv for x, instrumental variable c. The variance of our estimate of beta 2, so this is the variance of our estimate of beta 2. This is the thing that's on your printout. You get the standard deviation of beta 2 on the printout. That's how you make the t statistic. This is the thing you need to make the t. It's the variance of the estimate. You need the standard error for the t. You need to square root of this. It's the same thing. You learned last quarter that the way to estimate that is sigma squared u over the sum of the xi minus x bar squared. But in this case, it's 1 times 1 over r squared of x and z. This is the correlation between x and z. So one of the properties of instrumental variables is that it's correlated with x. That's the argument I'm making here, that yt minus 1 is correlated with yt. This is how strongly they're correlated. Okay. It's always the case that 0 is less than r squared is less than 1. The square root of this is their correlation. It can be between minus 1 and 1, but the square of that's always between 0 and 1. So 1 over a fraction, like 1 over a half is 2, right? 1 over a quarter is 4. 1 over an eighth is 8. So the smaller the correlation, what happens to the variance of your estimate? It goes up. As this correlation goes to 0, as your instrument becomes less and less related to the thing you're instrumenting for, the variance of your estimator goes way, way up. In the, in the perfect case, if you didn't need an instrument, essentially you get the, what's the correlation of x and x? 1. So in the standard case, this is 1 because you don't need an instrument. And you get the standard estimator. And so the instrumental variables give you consistency. You're closer, you're, you're, you're centered on the right thing asymptotically. You have consistency. 
But it does come at a cost because your precision is less. Because if these are only 80% correlated, you'll get, you'll get 5 fourths times 1 over 0.8 is 5 fourths. You'll get 5 fourths more than 1 times the variance you would have gotten if you didn't need an instrument. And so the instrumental variable blows up the, the variance and it blows it up more when there's less correlation. So a good instrument is very, very highly correlated with x, so that this is a big number. It's close to 1. And it's completely uncorrelated with the error, so that that term that we need to be 0 over there, so that this correlation of z and u goes to 0 as we need. And so big correlation with x, no correlation with u, and go to 10. Well, this is the point where I've got it all set up, ready to go. We start doing e-views, and I'll show you how to do this in the computer. That will have to be the first thing on Thursday. What bus right there is supposed to be e-views? Yes. So one of those is equal to zero then? What's that? Is one of those terms equal to zero? After we take the p-lift. This is one, that, that's the same. I'm, I'm just wondering how you went from 